Welcome to new Data Director tutorial. Today, my colleague Jan shows how to ensure data quality in your PIMCO object data and processes. He starts by showing us how to check data quality and show data quality problems to the content creators. Second to this, Jan sets up a review process, followed by different ways to build automations which first, reduce your own manual maintenance effort and second, ensure that your data quality is automatically high. Jan focuses on setting up automatic translation, including a possibility to still manually translate specific items, followed by a little course on how to generate new texts out of your already existing data. Last but not least, Jan shows us how to automatically assign uploaded assets to the corresponding data objects. How useful! Big shout out to Jan for again setting up this tutorial and now let's dive right in. I want to talk about ways to ensure that the data quality for your PIM data uh, will be as good as you want it to be. Um, for this, the data director can support you with certain mechanisms I want to talk about today. First thing is data quality checks so that you can show your content editors that something uh, with the product data quality is not satisfying. Then I want to tell you something how you can set up a review process um, for, for your data, data quality. And then I want to talk about certain ways to ensure or to, to build automa automations um, which ensure that data quality is automatically high because it reduces manual maintenance effort. So namely, I want to talk about automatic translation, including the possibility to manually translate certain items. Um, I, I talked about automatic translation before, but not uh, how to set up manual translation or how to inter interfere into this automatic pr translation process. Then I want to talk about text generation. So from your already existing data, you can generate new texts. And I want to talk about automatic assignment of assets. So as soon as somebody uploads an asset to the PIM core, the asset should be automatically assigned to the corresponding data objects. Okay, for this, I have set up a PIM core system um, and I'd like to start with data quality checks. Um, in my PIM core system, I have an import um, for uh, which imported the product data here. I have a really simple product class. Um, you can ignore for now this data quality calculated value field, but um, I will come to that in a minute. Uh, we have some localized fields here um, and some non-localized uh, also. And when we look at one of those objects, then we see it has uh, two languages configured in this PIM core. It has some data imported, some images, and also some technical data. Now, we want to check um, for data quality reasons, um, we want to check if a product fulfills certain criteria. Otherwise, it should not be publishable. Um, and for this, I will set up an automatic data port. Our source data type will be PIM core objects because as soon as a PIM core data object gets saved, this data port should run and check if the conditions are met. And if they are, then the object can be published. And if they are not met, then the, the object must not be published. Um, our target class is product. Also the source data class is product. Um, we will use inheritance for now. Um, Otherwise, uh, it would not work if, if those text fields or, uh, yes, especially the text fields um, would um, get inherited from the parent. And we will create um, our fields, um, our raw data fields 
First thing is ID because we want to find the object which got saved. Um, for this, we will need the ID. And then we will list all the fields which we want to check. Um, for, for my uh, class, I want to check if the name is filled. So I extract the name, uh, the English name. Um, of course, we can also check if the German name, but let's assume um, our um, minimum criteria is that the English name is filled. Um, then the short description should be filled. And um, I assume that we have an, an export. Um, this is here only a, a pseudo export. It does not really export something to a shop. But let's assume that in the shop, the first image is our main image, the first image from this image gallery. And this image should have at least a uh, thousand by a thousand pixel in size. So we extract from the image gallery images um, from the first element we extract the the width and also the height give this a nice name here And my last criteria is that we have at least one category. So we take categories, that's the relation, and we simply count the categories which have been assigned. Okay, let's save that. And now we want to set up a mechanism which um, guarantees that if any of those criteria is not met, that the object is not publishable. And we do that in attribute mapping. At first, the ID is our key field, so we have to map that here. And then we go to our published field, where we have to put a callback function in, which returns false if any of the data, data quality criteria are not met. And for this, we have a new template function. It's named disable if data quality is insufficient. And here we see that for all of our raw data fields, a virtual field gets created. And if any of those virtual fields is empty, then we return false. Uh, we see the virtual fields here. Now we have to assign the raw data fields to them. For the text fields, we just have to assign the field and do not have to put any callback function in here. But for the image fields, of course, an image always has a width if, if the image gallery has an image. Um, but here we want to check if the image is above 1000 or above or equal to 1000 pixels. And the same logic we want to use for the height. And for the categories, we just assign categories count. Um, here in the preview, we already see that the published field will be false. So let's see if this really works. Now, when we go to our object and click Save and Publish, then the data port will run and it, the object gets automatically reloaded. The, that is something new in the data director. When there is an automatic data port, which um, changes something on the just saved object, then the object will get reloaded um, automatically. But of course, it will only get reloaded if in the meantime, you do not change anything else. So when we click Save and uh, edit the short description, for example, then it would not get reloaded. The same is when you change the tab in between. Um, but anyway, uh, we see that the object is unpublished. Um, it's striked through here in the tree. And we also see that here in the data port um, run pa uh, history panel. Um, here we see, now we actually do not see it. Here's a value for published, but it's empty. For a really published object, we would see a one here. Um, and this means the object got unpublished. 
But now for the content editor, it's kind of a black box. He does not know why did the object not get published, although he clicked save and publish. For this, it would be a good idea to uh, visualize the data quality, cri quality criteria, which, might, uh, which currently do not have been fulfilled. And for this, we can use a calculated value field. Um, I, I prepared that before, but let's, let's create it again from scratch so that you see how this works. Data quality. Um, I think this is a mandatory field here. As a type, we choose HTML because we want to display a progress bar, how many criteria are fulfilled. And uh, the width, uh, we, we just take 500, for example. And now we can go back to the data director, to the attribute mapping. And there we see our calculated value field. Uh, beginning from data director three, it will be possible to populate data uh, calculated value fields, um, not only data quality fields, but uh, all calculated value fields with the data director. Normally for calculated value fields, you would have to enter um, a PHP class here, or if you choose expression here, then you would be able, uh, you can use a symphony expression, symphony expression language, but both have some disadvantages. For the class method, um, you have to create really a PHP file and put it on the file system and you have to know uh, which interfaces to implement and all such things. So it's a bit um, complicated um, to do that. And it's even impossible on some cloud hosted, uh, cloud based hosting solutions be uh, when you cannot create any files on the file system. On the other hand, there is the Symfony expression language, um, but this does allow for very limited uh, logic operations and of course, you have to learn a new language. So um, both are quite complicated. It would be easier um, to just use your uh, existing knowledge about PHP. And with, uh, with the data director, you can just use that um, so that the values which gets returned from this uh, callback function here for the cal calculated value fields gets uh, put to the calculated value field. Now to do that, we have a new template function. It's also check data quality and it reuses the already existing fields, which we used for the published, uh, published field. Uh, of course, you do not have to use uh, the, the, the logic for the published field um, for this check data quality calculated value field. Um, if only one of those callback functions is in place, it will also work. Now here in the preview, we already see a progress bar and that some um, data quality criteria are not met. So what gets returned from the callback function is really this HTML code and this gets set to the object. Now when we go back to the object and save again, then the data port will run in the background. It will get refreshed and now the content editor gets this um, overview of the data quality and he sees the problems uh, which currently exist. Now we see here the image width um, is not sufficient. Um, uh, one, one second. Uh, also this, for, uh, this message here at the front, this is configurable. Um, for example, when we say image width text to be um, or main, main image not wide in uh, or main image with lower than 1000 pixels and save again. Then we will see the new um, error message here. So to, to fix those errors, now the content editor can check the main image and just replace it. Um, I've prepared this here. We have shoe small and shoe big. When we take this shoe big, it's same image, but in a bigger resolution and save again. 
then the data quality criteria or the progress bar is bigger and now there's only one problem the categories count uh, or there is no category assigned um, we can assign the shoes category save again and now the data quality uh, is, is full and the object is also published um, we see it here at the, at the left in the tree uh, now it's published this is how we can set up data quality criteria. The next step would be that we could set up a review um, process or workflow. Um, here we see what the goal is. We want to set up a PIMCO report um, to view the data quality fields. And this can be the base for content editors to find products which need some data maintenance or which currently have data quality problems. And then we can use that same report as a base for a periodic check for products um, which do not fulfill the data quality criteria and have not been changed for at least a week. Uh, this means it, uh, it could be that currently no, um, no um, content editor is, feels to be responsible for these products. Or there is a major problem with those products and for this reason they do currently not fulfill those quality criteria. Um, for this I have created a report. A report um, is basically an SQL, um, SQL query, um, at least um, in this case. Uh, you, there are also other adapters, but in this case it's an SQL query and we just um, select all the, the products which have a data quality problem. So this is um, the, the condition here. And this unordered list HTML tag comes from our uh, calculated value return. So if there is, um, where is it? Uh, here, if there are errors, then we add those errors as an unordered list. Um, we saw that below uh, here, um, let's let's uh, remove the category again, then we'll see it again. I'm, oh, I mean this one here. And um, this is our report. And when we call this report, we will see our product, which has currently a data quality problem. Now this report can of course be embedded to a dashboard and be the base for our content editors to check for, uh, for the products which currently have some problems. And with such a report, they can, uh, for example, in the morning, check their dashboard, go to the objects, see what the problem is, and then uh, assign the the category, for example, in this case, yes. And then, of course, it will um, it will be removed from the report. Yes, it will be removed. But um, of course, we can also use such a report for um, for checking uh, what I said before uh, for checking if such a um, um, a product which does not fulfill the data quality criteria has not been changed for at least a week. Now let's cause a data quality problem again. And set up a new um, data quality review or yes, a review. And here we can use our generated report as an import source for this data port. So we select source data type PIMCO report. Uh, target class will be export because the goal of this data port is to send an email to a certain person um, for data objects which do not fulfill the data qual quality criteria and which have not been changed for more than seven days. Uh, we select our previously um, pro, uh, previously created report 
and create the raw data fields. Now in the attribute mapping, we have to set up the, that we want to export the, the data from the report and send, an e send those data as email. In the result callback function for this, we can use the callback function to, to output raw data as HTML. This is this one. And as a result document action, we want to send an email. So we choose send email. So here we can put in the email recipient. And the subject, data quality problems. And now when we execute this data, port, uh, this data port, then we see mail successfully sent. Uh, it's currently not configured here, but when we look under send, under send emails, then we will see data quality problems. And there is our email. This is the, the object. All those other emails here are from the tests before. Uh, you can ignore it for now. Um, but of course, currently, it will send all the objects. Now we can change our result callback function to only return data for objects which not, do not have been changed for more than seven days. So for this reason, we exported this last modified uh, timestamp here. And we can do this here. Um, uh, autocomplete does not work here yet. Raw item data last modified value is lower than time minus seven times this one. So this is the programming logic for an object which do, which has not been changed for more than seven days. And we save that and execute the function again, then we will see uh, that there is currently no data in the report, and for this, uh, or not in the report, but uh, uh, there is currently no data which um, has been added to the to the email, so the email is not being sent because that not does not make sense to send an empty email. Um, uh, so this works, but but to show you that it will work. I change this here to to a criteria for an object which which has not been changed for 30 seconds and now our object should get sent again mail successfully sent and when we look to the send emails there is our email again so this way you can set up a cron job which checks once a day if there are um if there are products which do not fulfill the data quality criteria and have not been changed for more than a week and then um, notify somebody to, to check if there is a problem. Now, all the next topics I want to handle today is about um, reducing manual editing. Um, and doing so, of course, you will reduce also the problems of, of uh, data with data quality. The first thing is automatic translation. Um, I've shown this before, but I've not shown how to interfere this process of, of automatic translation. For translation, it's again an automatic import. Um, this time we must not use inheritance because this would mean that we would translate the same text again and uh, for, for inherited texts and with this break the inheritance. So for example, if the English text got inherited before from the parent object and we would translate it, then for the child object, the inheritance for the target language would be broken. And for this reason, we will not translate inherited values. And of course, we will need the ID again and the text which we want to translate. In our case, it's the English name. 
And in attribute mapping, we map again ID to ID and the English name to the German name and configure it to get translated, automatically translate from English. Now, when we do that, uh, uh, I've missed the uh, one automatically. Um, when we do that now, save and publish, then we will see that the data port will run and the, um, the returned value for German is now this one. Um, the English value was this one, so it got translated. The problem may be now, of course, this is some uh, dummy data here, but the problem may be now that 20 dresses is a brand name, but the DeepL API did translate it to 20, oh, <laughs> 20 Kleider, um, but it may be that we do not want this because it's a brand name and it's the same brand name in German. And for this, we can use the shared translations. And the process works um, in that way that for all uh, translation keys, which begin with translate dot prefix, um, this signalizes the data director uh, translation processing that for those terms, a manual translation should be done. So when we, for example, add um, a term translate dot 20 dresses and put 20 dresses in English and in German, then it will use this translation instead, or it will signalize um, um, the DeepL API to ignore those terms and will instead manually translate it. In this case, it does not translate it, of course, because in all German, it's, it's the same as in the, in the um, source language. But here you can also manually translate terms if you are not satisfied with the automatic translation, which comes from the DeepL API or Amazon Translate. And when we now save our object again, wait a second. Then we will see that also in German it gets translated at 20, as 20 dresses, but for example the brown gets translated to the German word brown. Um, the rest here cannot be or shiver me timbers. It deep L automatically um, um, sees as uh, as a brand name. For this reason, it does not translate it, um, but the boots at the end will again translate it. So if, for example, this Shiver Me Timbers is not a brand name, of course, again, it's dummy data here, so um, <laughs> that's not a real product name. Um, but if this is, a brand, uh, is not a brand name, then of course you could translate it again uh, manually. So, there, so uh, this way you can interfere the automatic translation process. The next topic for today is text generation or reuse other fields contents. So the goal is to access other fields inside PIM core text fields. So for example, when you have an SEO title field, you could want to access the product name field, for example. Um, another goal of this is that you can generate text based on object data and text bricks with transparent rules. Um, and the, 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 the emphasized word here is transparent because when you would do that in a data port, of course you can do that, but then it's not transparent how this text gets generated to a content editor. And the goal is to make it manually changeable um, for, for example, that there is um, a default rule which generates some text, but in some special cases, perhaps the content editor may decide to not use that text, but use a different one. Uh, to do that, you can either set up an automatic import, which, which generates the data and imports it to a Visibig field or text field. But I'd like to show you also another possibility. 
For this, we have a new field type, text area with variables. You see it here, um, this comes from the data director, text area with variables. Uh, in general, it's a normal um, text field, but you can access other uh, fields there with this. Let's make this visible and reload our object. Here we see it, it's a description field. And here we can access other fields with those double curly braces, for example, the name. And the, uh, the advantage is that you immediately see here a preview, even if you have not saved the object. And now you can um, generate text like this, and then you will see immediately preview. Um, the nice thing here is that it also su um, supports logic operators. So the, the language which is being used here is Twig. I've prepared a little example. Um, here we have the logic name that extracts the, the product name from the field above here is one of the best. It uh, it's, uh, takes the first category. Oh, we have to assign the category first. One second. Um, right now we see it. Uh, 20, dresses, uh, 20 dresses brown shiver me. Timber boots is one of the best shoes. Um, this shoes comes from the category name from this object here at the bottom. Shoes. And it even supports logic operators like taking uh, if conditions. It also supports loops. Um, but in this case, it also, it's just um, a condition. If it is shoes, then we access the technical data from the um, object brick shoes here at the bottom. And there we can extract data. This shoe comes in a fantastic. Then we extract the color value from here. Absolutely trendy this spring. Uh, we have it in sizes and then we extract the selected sizes. Now, of course, this is nice for one product, but it gets even more powerful if we use inheritance. Um, this way you could um, you could um, define the template once um, and all the subtree items will get um, will get their um, uh, the, the description um, calculated automatically. So this already is configured to allow inheritance. Now, when we put that definition into this object here and put the 20 dresses object below it and remove it, of course, so that it gets inherited, then we will see that the, uh, the, the, the text gets inherited now. And now when we move another object, also below this uh, parent object, then we'll see that this also gets this category, uh, this 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 um, generated description. So until um, for boys and men, until here, it's the the product name is one of the best watches. This time it comes from the watches, and this time the condition is not true, and for this reason. Um, no additional text gets added. Uh, this way you can uh, generate rules um, based on the parent object. And of course, if you would imagine to have the categories um, here um, above, and this, this would allow to, um, to have certain um, description for all the products of a certain category. This means you do not have a general rule for all the products, but you can group them um, when you add, for example, a new object below here. Um, 
other generation rule and you could put that here and then here change uh, to another to another um, rule and when we now refresh it so with this mechanism you can um, of course manually edit it then uh, of course um, as this is a normal text field here and then this object would have this description uh, with such a field type it's more transparent uh, to the to the to the content editor and it follows the same um, approach which for example uh, other rule based services um, for text generation have now the last thing uh, i want to talk about today is automatic assignment of assets uh, imagine a process where um, a photographer uploads an image to PIMCore, then he has to respect or put the, the, the image file to a certain folder. And then he has to manually add the, the image to a product or perhaps this uh, even another person is responsible to do that. Um, it would be much easier if this would all be done automatically. And this can be done with a data director. For this, we can set up a new data port named assign images to products. The source data type this time will be the asset. And we need the ID from uh, of the asset and we need the file name of the asset because we want to extract the SKU of the file from the file name. So as we see here, the goal is to automatically assign an uploaded asset to a product based on the SKU in the asset file name. So let's go back to our product here. And this has the SKU, this one, and I've prepared an image which has the same SKU. Now, when we upload this, it should get automatically assigned to this image gallery here. We save this data port and set it to be run automatically. Um, the, uh, well, the target class, of course, is product this time. Um, and we want to extract the SKU from the file name. And for this, this depends, of course, on the file name structure, which you define. But in our case, the SKU is directly accessible from the file name before the file extension. So we extract the SKU this way. Uh, this this uh, function here at the end um, finds the first dot in the file name, so that's the file extension, and extracts everything before. And we want to add this to the image gallery, and for this we use the template function assign existing image, but this time we do not want to filter by pass, but by ID. And when we execute this by uploading an image, and then we will see the cancelled um, things were bef because I had the, the object still open. Um, then we will see at the end uh, that the object got saved and that the images value saved. Now let's look at the object if it really got saved. And there we see our new image, our new QR code. This is the one which I've uploaded. Um, so this got automatically added to the data object. 
Um, and then it's the first thing to automatically assign it, but perhaps we also want to not put everything here in, in the root folder, but to structure our assets a bit. For this, we can set up another data port. Uh, assets move to, uh, move to folder. Um, let's, re let's rename this here that I have a nice folder structure here. Um, move to folder. Um, this time we also extract the data from our asset and uh, the target class this time is also asset. And I want to move the asset file to the category um, of the product, the main category of the product, which it belongs to. And for this reason, I will set up a dependent import. So first the image will get assigned to the product. And then this second import will be called with the uh, category from the product so that the asset can be moved to this category. And we can access this with the double curly braces again. And we can also use this here as a filter condition. ID of the asset equals ID. Uh, now to, when we would use it this way, then there would be um, an, SQL, an SQL error. Um, we could either use it this way or we can define a default value and default value could be 1260 for example then we see it here um, now this means when there is um, an id provided by an import parameter then this will get used and otherwise the default will get used now of course we have to call the the this asset moving data port from the other data port as a dependent import. From this, we go back to the attribute mapping and select in the result callback function to start a dependent import. Here we get some new virtual fields. The dependent import ID is now 19. And we want to set up dependent import parameters. So namely, um, we can return an array here where we define the parameters for the um, for the other import so we have used id and this will be um, the asset id uh, i think params raw the, it's params raw item data id and we want to provide the category and we currently do not have the category in our raw data, but we have to access it from the object which currently gets processed, which the image gets assigned to. And for this, we can use a data query selector where we select the product whose SKU is the value from our key field SKU in this case. So here it's a map field. We have mapped it before. Uh, where is it? There. We extract the SKU from the file name. We reuse it here. And from this object, which gets returned, <coughs> we want the first category um, to get returned. Um, and namely the, the uh, let's take the key. Save. And then we already see here it's shoes uh, in the preview. But let's see if this really works. Um, when we now save an object, uh, an asset, then first the assignment data port will get triggered. It assigns the product to the, uh, it assigns the asset to the product, and then afterwards it will call the the second data port to move it to a second folder, uh, to another folder. Um, 
but this moving to a folder we have not set up yet. Um, in this other data port in the attribute mapping, we use the ID which got um, provided as a parameter and we put it to the field category and our as a target folder will be products images. So the goal is that it goes under product images, shoes, and then the image. File. Uh, now let's see if this works. Is everything autom uh, no, this does not need to be automatically. Right. So when we save this, then the first data port will be executed. Uh, the, the object is still open. So now it got processed and it called the other data port. This is now also finished. Now let's see if it worked. The image is now under product images shoes. Now to explain the process of dependent imports a bit more in detail, let's take another example. I use the SKU from another product and rename our, imp uh, our image file to the new name. Now, when we upload this new file to the assets root folder, then the first thing which gets executed is our automatic data port. Um, this is this one. Um, here we see that the asset ID and the file name, those data got extracted. Then in the processing, we see that for the SKU field, the callback function extracted the SKU from the file name, and it used that SKU to find this product here at the top, um, or, or here's the SKU which got extracted, here the product got found, and it uses the image ID which got provided to add the image to the image gallery. Um, here at the other fields, those are the virtual fields for the dependent data port. There we see that the callback function returned this, the ID is 1268, and the category, the data query selector um, is shown here itself, it's not resolved yet, but we see at the bottom that first the product gets saved with the added item for the image gallery and afterwards a new process gets queued and that's DD complete for um, a complete import for of data port 19 and as parameters for this import we get the ID and category provided. Now let's see um, in a data port 19 there we have or there we got the ID as a parameter and we got watches as category. Now that's a bit misleading here, um, but it's our category parameter. Now, um, this then gets used to move the file. We see here that the ID is our key field, and um, in this moment, the image is still under the root, so that's because of the lead, uh, we see that of the leading, because of the leading slash. And then it sets the ID, of course, again, and it changes the path to watches. And as we configured the, the asset target path to product images, it even um, prepends this product images path, uh, folder before the watches. So the final path then is product images, watches, and then our file name. And then it saves this file and when we look at our product, then we see that the image got automatically added. And when we open this, then we see that it got moved under watches. So this way you can tell your users to just upload their files uh, to the root folder, or perhaps you could set up an input folder. And as long as the file naming um, follows a, a predefined structure, 
then everything will, else will work automatically. So images will or assets will be automatically assigned to the data objects and the image files or asset files will move to the desired directory. Now, one last thing I'd like to mention is that when you have a lot of imports, which um, so dependent imports or multiple imports, which import to the same field, then it might get, uh, you might lose overview um, Yes, which, which data ports are involved um, when a certain field um, gets handled. And for this, we have a new uh, feature in the attribute mapping. Uh, when you click a certain field in the attribute mapping, then you see all the data ports which are involved in importing and exporting this field. For example, for the asset pass, we see that the asset pass gets, um, gets uh, changed by the data port 19. So that's our asset moving data port. And this asset moving data port gets triggered as a dependent import from data port 18. So in this case, uh, it looks um, quite simple, but you can imagine that if multiple data ports um, import to the asset pass or change the asset pass, then this will get a bit more complex. Uh, we can see that, for example, for the published field for our data quality um, import, when we click that, it's a bit uh, more complex. Of course, we have our data quality import uh, where we uh, check for the data quality uh, criteria. This imports to the published fields, but we also have our initial item import, uh, which I did not show in this video, but which I um, executed to create all the products, this also imports to the published field. And perhaps we have another data port, in this case it's only a, a dummy data port, uh, which triggers this uh, ERP item import. And on the right hand side we see um, the export data ports, in this case it's export products to shop. Um, we see that this data port uses the published field of the products um, as a raw data field. So this way you get an overview of a certain field or how a certain field gets used um, in all your data ports. So this ensures that not only your product data uh, gets a high quality, but also uh, your data processes in general um, have a high quality and that you keep keep an overview, keep track of all the all the things which you have set up uh, with the data ports. So this wraps it up. Um, that was our data quality checks tutorial. I hope it was useful for you. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to write us an email. The email is in the video description. And thanks for listening. If you got any questions about this or other data director features, feel free to contact us via help at blackbit.de. Also, make sure to check out our other data director tutorials. Maybe some of your questions are already covered by them. And by subscribing to our channel, you'll be always up to date. Thank you for watching.